uh, generative AI. And let's give a warm round of applause for Jinjin. Jin. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm Jinjin from MasterCard, and I work as a software engineer for four years. Uh, I'm also a graduate from Master of uh, Business Analytics from AS. So let's start the introduction to generative AI with a focus on large language models. So today's agenda is firstly brief history of generative AI, then the history of supervised learning to large language models, and use cases of generative AI in FinTech, and how to use LLM in our generative AI project. And then there is a hands-on session to customize the large language model using retrieval augmented generation and lastly, responsible AI. Firstly, let's see the brief history of generative AI. In 1943, neurophysiologist Warren McCullen and mathematician Walter Pitts wrote a paper on how neurons work. And they, at that time, they don't use advanced computers. They can only create the model uh, to simulate the neuron behavior using electrical circuits. However, in 1950s, we finally have more advanced computers, so we can model the neural networks uh, using computers. And for more than half a century, deep learning was a nice idea, but deemed as impractical, until a convolutional neural network called Alex Knight won the ImageNet 2012 challenge. AlexNet show the, shows that the deep learning was more than a dream. With huge data set from ImageNet, they managed to classify mm -hmm. images into a thousand object categories. This shows the world how to make the deep learning practical. And in 2017, uh, the well-known paper, Attention is All You Need, published by Google Brain, introduced a novel architecture for large language model, the transformer. It used a self-attention mechanism, which is well-suited for la language understanding. And then, you know the story, in November 2022, OpenAI released uh, ChatGPT. And at that time, it was using GPT-3, 3.5, and in 2023, it released GPT-4, which is a more powerful model. And at the, list, uh, at the release of ChatGPT, it gains one million users within five days. The rest of ChatGPT, and with its unprecedented performance, it actually widely increased the awareness and uh, credibility of generative AI. How does the chat GPT name come from? Uh, we all know what is chat, but GPT is a type of transformer. It stands for generative pre-trained transformer. A uh, transformer, as we described before, it's uh, a model architecture that is good for understanding language. Uh, generative means it's given some content, it's going to generate new content. So instead of the more familiar predictive and uh, classifications, it's generating new stuff that's not seen in the given data. And pre-trained, it means it's built on a static data set. The model cannot learn in real time from changes in its environment. Uh, for example, initial ChatGPT data ends in September 2021. If you are familiar with AI, this picture should be, uh, you have seen a lot of times. It shows the relationship between all those buzzwords in this, in this area. Firstly, the artificial intelligence is the overarching field, comprises ML and deep learning, and focuses on building systems to resolve problems or exhibit behaviors that would otherwise require human intellect. 
And then machine learning is a subfield of AI focusing on systems that can learn patterns from historical data and use them on novel data to make forecasts and predictions. And usually it is classified into supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. And then there is a new area called Okay, no longer new. It's deep learning. It's a subfield of machine learning that employs neural networks to learn sophisticated data. And usually, it comprises hundreds of layers. That's why it's called deep. And it employs both supervised and unsupervised learning techniques based on the problem context. And where does the generative AI located? It's within the deep learning field. And generative AI, within generative AI, we also have large language model. And transformer is an architecture of large language model. This is the relationship. Let's uh, look into supervised learning. This is because in for most of the business use cases, it's good enough to know supervised learning and generative AI. And it happens that supervised learning lays the foundation for generative AI today. And supervised learning is super good at labeling things. It has many use cases. It, for example, uh, and all the training data will require uh, input and an output so that the model can learn from the pattern and be able to produce the output when new inputs come out. So with the email, if we want to differentiate whether it's a span or not, we will label it as zero or one. If it's one, it's a span. If zero is not, then this is how span filtering works today. And online advertising, another very lucrative area, by given uh, the advertisement and some user information, and we predict whether the user click this ad or not. And if they click, that means it will generate more revenue, right? So if we can predict this ad is more related to this user or not, potentially we can increase the click-through click rate and increase the revenue generated. And for self-driving cars with the image in front of the cars and the radio radar info, we can predict and label the position of other cars. This is how the self-driving cars work and the driver assessment system work. And in healthcare area, with uh, X-ray image given, we can label the area with where the disease exists. And this is Similar for visual expectation for phones, we can recognize and label the area on the phone image where the scratches and where are the defects. And another use case is speech recognition where we can translate audio recording to text transcript. And if you own a business and you frequently receive reviews for your products or your business, then you can have a reputation monitoring system to detect the sentiment of restaurant reviews to tag it as negative or positive and tackle all the negative feedbacks. There used to be three very uh, important roadblocks for technical breakthroughs in AI area. However, with the advancement of technology, it's gradually all resolved. The firstly is the lack of sufficient large volume of training data. However, with more with the prevalent of internet, so we have more and more internet data. And for private data, the increased data capacity and the decreased cost of hard drives have solved this data limitation. And secondly, we used to have lack of compute resources but it's now solved by increasing power for CPUs and GPUs in data centers. And certainly, we lack uh, the sufficiently sophisticated machine learning algorithms. But with the focus of deep learning, this problem is also solved. 
the focus of deep learning, how do we solve the third problem? The more sophisticated machine learning algorithm is actually firstly developed by uh, large scale supervised learning. In 2010s to 2020s, we, the scientists find out that if we use very fast, very, pos uh, very powerful computers with a lot of memory, then with more data fed to it, the more, the higher the performance it will achieve. The result will become better and better. It's not like the marginal return is diminishing. So this idea of building very large model for labeling things is how we got to generative AI today. Let's see how generative AI can generate, te generate text. So firstly, we have a prompt. I love eating here. Then the model will predict what's the next word. Maybe it will generate, I love eating cakes with fresh blueberries. Uh, a second generation may produce, I love eating food from different countries. So it can generate very different things. Large language models are built by using supervised learning to repeatedly predict the next word. So in, for this sentence, how is it generated? With the prompt, it predicts the next word, food. Then with a new prompt, it will predict the next word, from. So it will just repeatedly predict the next word to complete the sentence. So from this generation process, we can already foresee there are many business use cases. Back in 2013, the funding for AI was just three billion with less than a thousand deals. However, with recent progress and more and more applications, uh, all those big type gens are investing a lot into generative AI and they are producing their own proprietary machine learning models and uh, large language models and putting those functionalities to their existing products as well. As I am from FinTech, uh, we let's look at the, how AI works in FinTech area. Firstly, uh, machine learning is very useful in anti-money laundering and fraud detection and customer recommendations. A natural language processing is very useful in robot advice, where robot can provide financial advice to users without any human interference. And chatbot, this is very popular and it appears in many applications, and but usually it's hard coded, and you need to wait for very long until a live agent to contact you. However, with large uh, large language models, it will be quicker for you to get a non-robot response. Maybe you can solve the your problem without the help of live agent. And another area is algorithmic. <laughs> trading, the current time series analysis can be improved by AI, and there are even large language models can help with time series analysis. Uh, let's see some specific use cases of OpenAI. Uh, OpenAI collaborate with payment and commerce brands, Klarna. Uh, they create a suite of service, including searching and comparing prices from thousands of online shops. So within the ChatGPT interface, they are able to uh, call those agents' APIs to retrieve all those informations related to prices and online shopping. And also OpenAI collaborate with OpenTable to provide restaurant recommendations and booking reservations within a chat session. So you no longer need to open so many tabs. Within a chat session, you can manage to do a lot of things. And within MasterCard, we have classification where amongst 
account intelligence for issuers, fraud and risk uh, detected using artificial intelligence. And uh, we also use that in small business credit analytics. The prediction area, we use AI to also to produce authorization optimizer and determine loyalty and personalized card length offers. We also provide recommendation for card holders and produce transaction-based predictive analytics. And for natural language processing area, we can produce use AI to match income payments with outstanding invoices and reduce manual efforts by automating payment reconciliation. MasterCard also have a step pass initiative, which you know uh, invest in AI related small companies in areas like cyber security, credit decisioning, and digital ID and onboarding. So if you guys later produce something very innovative and payment related, please look for step pass and they may invest in you. So with such uh, prior knowledge, we move on to building a artificial intelligence project. So for example, if you want to own a business and then you want to monitor your reputation, how do you do? You periodically collect all the feedbacks and put them into a machine learning system, right? So if it's a good feedback, your label is as positive. If, uh, if it's a negative, feedback you label it as negative, then your employees will handle it. So firstly, we need to get the label data, then train an AI model on the data, then deploy the model. <coughs> and traditional development for such a system will take months, and this is what the code usually look like. So it will take uh, for beginner, it will take super long to understand all these things. However, with large language models, the prompt-based development is much faster. Later in the workshop, the coding session, you will see how the how it will work within minutes. So, the prompt is a question. It's something to instruct the model how to behavior, how to behave. So we have an instruction text and classify the following review and then we have review text so we put the review to ask to to let the LM to uh, execute the instruction then the code to call LM then the response will be printed out The life cycle of a generative AI project starts from project scoping, then build the system, then internally you need to evaluate whether the results are good or bad. You need, definitely need some subject matter expert to look at the results. It's not quite easy to let the LM to handle everything at the initial phase. <coughs> then, with this internal evaluation, you will need to improve the system. And also, when you actually deploy it, you, you need to continuously monitor the outputs and go back to internal evaluation <coughs> and improve the system again. It's a highly experimental process, and we repeatedly find and fix <coughs> mistakes. But how do we improve the performance uh, here I provide four tools to use. Firstly is prompt engineering, where we take the prompts provided to the LM so that it gives the best possible result. Second is retrieval augmented generation. We give LM, LM and access to external information that the original, original pre-trained data set doesn't know. And thirdly, fine-tuned models. We can use open-sourced uh, large language models, all those proprietary LLMs with fine-tuned API, and then use our own data to fine-tune the existing models. And the fourth option is 
uh, studio on LLM, but this will lead, need to take a long time and it's very expensive. You need to purchase the GPU uh, and high quality computer <coughs> to perform all the stuff. Am I too quick? <laughs> okay, we can take a short break for now. And please download this zip. So just now I was talking about the tools to improve performance. And the second option is retrieval augmented generation. It looks very complicated. What is it? Let's firstly look at what is retrieval augmented generation. It can enhance output generated by pre-trained models by retrieving external data and add them to the original queries. So this is the overall architecture. You can see that with a certain amount of documents, then we perform text chunk split. I forgot to mention, if uh, please prepare a small PDF on your laptop so later you can try to use your own data. Oh, please make sure there is no sensitive information within that PDF. <laughs> because we are going to use OpenAI uh, API later. And do anybody know what is embedding? Okay, don't know. Okay, let's go back to this uh, architecture diagram later. Let's look at what is embedding. Embeddings are computer-readable representations of text that capture semantic meaning. So if you have a sentence, then the computer cannot understand the sentence as raw language. So it can only understand numbers. So we firstly convert the entire sentence into a vector. This is embedding. So embedding is a high dimensional vector that can represent the meaning of text. That's why it can keep the relationship of sentence. We can see that in the image, right image. What time is the checkout? The same sentence in different languages are close to each other because they have the similar meaning. And how late is the full open? It has a different meaning, so it's further away. An open AI's embedding API is priced at 3,000 pages per US dollar. And the data is sent to open AI. So we recommend we can search for open source models to replace that so that we can don't spend any money. And we also make use of vectors database in that architecture diagram, which we will visit later. The vector database is a special type of database designed to store and search retrieve embeddings effectively. Usually, the database we commonly use um, contains the characters and strings. However, this type of database um, contains high dimensional vectors and enable semantic search when question with another vector so that it can retrieve similar vectors to that new input. And popular database includes PyCon, um, HNSW Lab, uh, Malvus, Chroma, and uh, Fast. And many of them are open source. So let's look at this architecture diagram again. If you have a set of documents, then we split them into small chunks. And for each chunk, we embed them and obtain the high dimensional numerical representation of each of that, each of sentence, not sentence, the small chunks. And then save them into a vector database. So with this preparation done, we already have the information to be retrieved. Then when a user asks a question, this question is sent to this vector database 
to perform a similarity search, and it will produce ranked results for from the database, and then this retrieved a similar retrieved text with similar context will be attached to the original question, so that this LLM knows some some more context, so they can produce a better response. So if the fixed data set that used to pre-train this large language model don't know anything about the new data you you put in, then uh, originally it was not able to answer the correct answer. But now with the retrieval, it can produce the correct answer. Okay, let's move on to the Jupyter Notebook. <clears throat> Not sure you have tried OpenAI before. If you, you may need the OpenAI API key. And this, what would I show on this? Hmm? Why? Mirror. Yeah. Oh God, how do I mirror? Uh, I mean. I mean, I mirror this. I mirror this, so it's still showing this. So should I stop it then? Yeah, stop it then and just stop. Yeah, so you don't follow. <coughs> I think it's using to mirror this page. So do you mirror? Oh. No, no. Wait. What? Screen <coughs> mirror? I need this page. Screen sharing? I couldn't share it. Okay, Google. Okay. Uh, system settings. Okay. Displays. Is there a displays? <coughs> Yeah, it's working. Okay. Yeah, it's working. Yeah. The zoom? Yeah, it's working. Okay. Hey, why is it yellow? <coughs> it's not weird. Yeah, I think it's... Why is it yellow? Elgato. Oh, okay. Yeah, this, yesterday it's also like yellow. Okay. Okay, are you ready? Let's look at the code. Let's so like look at how uh, OpenAI can produce, generate a response from large language model. And the model I'm using is GPT 3.5. Uh, 
Yeah. Maybe you can zoom in a bit for them to see. Thanks. If you have a piece, if you have a laptop with you guys, you can open. And you don't want to use Collab or Jupyter Notebook, you can use HTML to open in any browser. And you can see the response. So Collab is an online ID to run Python code in this source. So it's very easy to use. And it's similar to Jupyter Notebook. So firstly, we need to install OpenAI, and because there are many versions that may have uh, work. to have everything work together, you need to make sure the version you use is compatible to each other. And here, I'm using an older version, but if you create your own code, you may use a newer version, but you need to ensure that the versions don't conflict to each other when you do your own project. So here you need to put a uh, open AI API key, and it open AI gives you some free credits to do some experiments. So if you already have that, replace your key here. And open AI has the completion API to predict the next word. So you can complete the. This is the API used to generate response. And temperature zero actually means to do not hallucinate at all. Just produce the most accurate answer. So with this prompt, the banana pudding, what's really tasty is a positive sentiment. It produced the correct answer. And if I put more reviews together, then it can also produce the response in the format I want. So actually with Python, you can um, format it in whatever way you like. We can count the number of positive and negative reviews. Are we ready for the uh, customization of your own chatbot part? So you should have a small PDF with no sensitive information with you. Then by clicking this, by running this cell, it will allow you to choose files from your local machine. And then uh, it will upload. Um, I use the welcome to NUS file. And then after uploading it, this is uh, the command to show the file structure, list all the files. So I will have a uh, welcome to SPF here. Then I also use LangChain, which is a, a very powerful tool to orchestrate all your large language models, embedding models together, so that uh, to make it much easier to build a machine learning project. And also, I use the uh, PDF loader to load this PDF and split them according to pages. Then we realize in each page, there are a lot of new lines. So we need to do some data cleaning work. So what I did is to uh, split them into small chunks. Because for large language models, there is the window, input window, and there is a limited size of <coughs> input you can put in. So it's also very important to make sure the length of the question is within the limit. It's usually 2048 tokens. And Lama to doubled it. So here, uh, I split it into chunk size of 512 and uh, overlap of 25. 
uh, chunk size is very easy to understand. So for each page, we chop it into smaller sizes. And the overlap is the overlap between neighboring chunks. We haven't reached the embedding part. So instead of using OpenAI embedding API, we can also use open source embedding models and their performance is also very good. For example, uh, sentence transformers. And ChromaDB here is the vector store I mentioned in the uh, slides before. So here we load the embedding model and then use the vector store to create the embedding for the document text and save them into the directory we want. And this is a command to store it within notebook. If you are writing a script um, in a project not in notebooks, then this line is not needed. So after we run this out, we can see that the file structure changed. We have a new folder here. And within this folder, we go inside, we can see there are these files. <coughs> these files are ChromaDB files, and all the high dimensional vectors are saved inside. The current directory is vector db here. So we have saved our database. Then we can load it to achieve for our conversation later. This is how we load the database from the persist directory. And then we can start to query this database. As I said, it has the function to do similarity search. So if I ask what is the NUS widely known for, then from the first document it retrieves, we can see that it is widely known for its innovative and rigorous education, research, and entrepreneurship. <laughs> so it will produce the uh, most relevant text. And I set key to three, so it will retrieve three documents. It also asks what are some US society and interest groups. Then it gives me relevant responses. And how to use this database in um, Q Q and A's? So Langing also provides such uh, classes and frameworks to uh, put them all together. So are there any questions? Am I too fast? So we make use of Langchain here. Um, with Langchain, you can actually use open sourced models from Hugging Face. So your, your, in your own project, if you don't want to pay to OpenAI, if you use up your credits, you are also able to use other models to make your project entirely local. So in this, uh, Q&A chatbot, you use a template to put in your chat history, context, and questions. Then with the LM will produce the response for you. 
Similarly, we need the open AI keys here. Then uh, if we want the chat history, we can put a memory. And we ask the data DB to retrieve the top three ranked uh, relevant context. And search type is where you can modify. There are many uh, different ways of ranking the relevant context. So we can see that the response contains the top three relevant contacts. In this way, you can make your response more relevant to your own data set and fit in the data that is unknown to the original model. You can get out it. And there are many ways to call this LLM. If you want to use uh, generative AI in your own project, I recommend you to uh, read some articles from Towards Data Science, and there are many tutorials 
online, and also you have free access to large language models, pre-trained or fine-tuned from Hugging Face. I think you have already known how to run a, a Python notebook and you also get to know what are some tools to be used in producing an AI LM project. Lastly, let's look at the dimensions of responsible AI. So firstly, we want to ensure that AI doesn't perpetrate or amplify biases. This, is, this work is also done in the pre-trained large language models. So if you ask very harmful questions, it will answer you. Also transparency, we want to make sure AI system and the decisions are understandable to the stakeholders, to the people impacted. So when you scope your project, it's better to do a survey to the target group, target user group. And also privacy, protecting user data and ensuring confidentiality. So when you play with OpenAI API or any other non-open sourced models, make sure you don't leak any sensitive information. And third, uh, firstly, security. We want to guard AI system from malicious attacks. This is an ongoing, there are a lot of ongoing research on ensure the security of AI systems. And finally, we want to ensure AI is used for beneficial purposes. I believe everybody can produce projects only for beneficial purposes here. So congratulations, we have come to the end of the workshop. I hope you feel it's useful.